All right. We'll jump into our first article, which is about an AI model developed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, um, to help save firefighters' lives. But first, let's talk about flashover. Flashover is a phenomenon that happens during structure fires, so like in a building or in a house, where the temperature increases really, really rapidly and it gets to this high rate, but nothing's actually burning. Nothing's ignited yet. And then when a condition of the ventilation changes and a lot of extra oxygen is introduced, everything in the room spontaneously combusts, catches on fire. Um, in layman's terms, we can say it turns a bad structure fire into a deadly one. So, it's, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean no, to stop it's, you. It's, it's, not, it's not great because not only does it get a lot worse, stuff catches on fire, stuff starts to burn. It's also really, really hard to predict when it's going to happen. So you have to know when the temperature conditions are right. You have to know when the ventilation conditions are right to basically be able to tell firefighters to get out of the building before there's a flashover. And it basically looks like an explosion in the house. I'm, I'm trying to apply this to like what I think a fire looks like in my head. So you have, let's say a house, it's on fire. The heat is building up on the inside, but oxygen is limited. And then let's say you have people that are going to start escaping by opening, jumping through the windows or opening the door. And then once that flow of oxygen starts entering the room, that heat has now more oxygen to burn. So then the fire starts going exactly. like really wild. Is that what's happening? Everything that's in that room that's okay. combustible ignites all at once. It and that's called like flashover. It, yeah, something exploded in there and that's called a flashover. Okay. So this AI model by NIST is trying to predict where flashover, where and when flashover can occur and use that or use data from heat detectors and smoke detectors inside buildings to predict where and when that's going to happen so they can warn firefighters, warn people and get them out of that area of the building or get them out of the building before a flashover occurs, which is how a lot of firefighters get injured or killed in the line of duty. How dependable is the data they're getting? Like I'm assuming after a certain temp temperature point, your electronics are going to fry, right? So do they need like a continuous stream of data and like what happens when that data stream stops? Well, that's what's made it really challenging for them to predict flashovers so far is okay. technology has made it, you know, the limitations of te technology keep it from um, having reliable data all the way up until the flashover happens. So flashover occurs above 600 degrees Celsius. That's like 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. So really, really hot. Okay. Most electronics fail around 150 degrees Celsius. So they start to melt, they fry, you know, the smoke detector, the heat detector, those are all gone around 150 Celsius. So what NIST did that's, I'm going to say it, their secret sauce, um, they actually created a 3D simulation on a computer of a house and they ran over 5,000 simulations on it in different configurations, basically collecting data using their virtual sensors up to 150 degrees Celsius, then they cut them off, assuming that they died, and then compared it to the end condition, so whether flashover actually occurred in that room, in that building, and by tracking the way that the temperature climbed in certain areas of the house um, using these temperature sensors, they're able to predict whether flashover happens by doing all these simulations and training a machine learning model. Quick question about the simulations. You said they simulated a house with different configurations, and I'm assuming that means you have one building type and then the layout of furniture is different, the layout of the heat detector is different, the windows and stuff is different, but did they only test on one building type? Yeah, so you're on the right track. They tested a three-bedroom, one-story ranch-style home, which is one of the most common homes in the U.S. So that's why they wanted to that train makes sense. It, um, using this this type of model. But what they did is they tried all different sorts of configurations, say a certain piece of furniture catches on fire in a certain room of the house. Okay. Um, they test that piece of furniture igniting along with different configurations of doors and windows being open to change the ventilation in the house and they did that through all the different per possible permutations within the house for all the different furniture and different rooms as well as different configurations of windows being opened or closed so that they, they um, had all these simulations that they used to train the model or to test the model against so they did five over five thousand simulations total mm -hmm. they used the first four thousand to train it they used another 500 to reinforce it and test it. And then the last 500 about where, where they did the final, final test before they put it out into the real world. And, and what, what, what did the real world testing look like? So they burned down 13 houses um, in the real world with sensors set up to the same configurations that they were testing in the simulation. 
Um, and with an 86% accuracy, they were able to predict within one minute a flashover occurring where and when it was going to happen in the house. So that gives firefighters enough time to exit 86% of the time. You know, that's actually kind of low comparatively to some of these AI um, and machine learning models we've been talking about so far in the podcast. I'm used to hearing things in like the upper 90%, right. know, 95%, 99%. Especially but if it's like a, mission critical, like if it's something that's, you know, has people's lives on the line. Exactly. So it, it's challenging for us to hear 86% and why they would want to put it into practice. But actually what they said is the false negatives, the times where the model was less accurate than they had hoped, it was actually giving a false positive. So um, they were saying, you know, in this case, the model was saying there's going to be a flashover, you know, in one minute, and it actually ended up happening in two. So it was actually more conservative. It was safer for firefighters. In most of these cases, the model wasn't going to tell firefighters that they were safe when they weren't. So it was just being too cautious, which is exactly what you want from yeah. something that's protecting your life. If it's going life. to err on one side, you'd rather err on the side of caution. Right. And, you know, the uh, million-dollar question with all these things is that why isn't it deployed yet? Like, is there any big downfall with this implementation that we need to know about? Well, I really liked the way that they approached this and the candor that they have with their research is they basically said, we know that this doesn't work as well as it should. And they discovered that doing the real world tests. And what they found was that temperature sensors in certain enclosed areas of the house, like a bedroom or a closet, actually predicted flashover incorrectly because of the high amount of heat that would be trapped inside a small enclosed area. So the way that they were testing it in their simulation okay. was in like a big open room like the kitchen or the living room, but the smaller enclosed rooms like the bedroom or the closet actually get hotter before flashover occurs. So what they're doing is they're basically going back to the drawing board on how to incorporate that feedback that they got by doing these real world tests. Um, and that will give them a more rigorous model that they feel comfortable applying in the real world to help keep firefighters safe. Gotcha. So it's still like an iterative process of refining their model before they start really deploying it. And, yeah, and they were really open and honest about this works, this doesn't work, this is something we're learning. I really like, I mean, all scientists in general really do a great job, but specifically these, these folks at NIST, they're not sugarcoating anything. They say, here's what's good, here's what's bad, here's what we're working on, and we're going to make it better. Well, that's what I was going to say. I've Really appreciated the uh, anything firefighter related we've covered on the podcast so far. Uh, episode 13, we talked about the magneto quasi static fields that you can use to locate firefighters inside of buildings again for their yeah. safety. And that was sponsored by the, Home, the Department of Homeland Security and NASA. And I feel like whenever you have, like you said, whenever you have government organizations handling these things, they're not doing it for a profit. They just want to, you know, help a group of people. So they're just very open with it. They're like, look, these are the pros, these are the cons, and we're still working on it. Yeah, and I'd be interested to see the stuff from episode 13, the location system for tracking firefighters combined with this to say, you know, hey, firefighter A, you're near a room that's about to experience a flashover. You should get out of there. Definitely. So, I mean, between the two, I think we're seeing, and I'm I'm personally invested in this. That's what I was going to say, brother yeah. brother Caleb is a firefighter. Um, seeing technology like this that will hopefully make his job safer makes me really, really excited. Definitely. And hey, I'm in the same boat. I'm looking forward to it. Caleb's the man. He just got into the, the fire school. Congrats, Caleb. Yeah. 